Waters in the Arctic ecosystem are predicted to be warmer on average in the future than they have been in the past. And we were really shocked when we went out and sampled in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And we found water temperatures were at levels that we weren't predicted to hit until 2050. So we had a really unique opportunity to study the future Arctic. What we were able to do with the integrated ecosystem research approach was we collected information on everything from ocean physics and chemistry to every aspect of the biology and then we were able to look at the linkages from the physics to the biology to really understand why we were seeing the dramatic changes that we were seeing. And what we hope that will allow us to do then is to build better informed ecological models so that we can better predict what those average conditions may be in the future once climate warms to that point. If you were to go scuba dive underneath the water and you have your mask and you focus on what's right in front of you, you would see in your near field vision particles floating around and those particles are from a variety of phytoplankton, there's zooplankton in there and there's the particles that they produce and those particles are important to the way the system functions. Phytoplankton in the surface ocean produce a lot of organic material and that gets into particles and those particles, a fraction of them end up sinking through the water column and down towards the bottom of the ocean where they feed the benthos and the organisms that are there. So that process draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into the ocean and stores it in the sediments or the deep ocean and we're looking at how that transfer of organic matter from the surface ocean down to the deeper parts happens, what controls it and why it matters. So on this cruise, we've been uh, sorting animals uh, for about half the day and then setting up experiments that allow us to look at their rates of respiration, the rates at which they're, they're consuming oxygen as they burn and metabolize the food inside them. We've been studying the rates at which they produce eggs and we've been studying the rates at which uh, their bodies grow and they go through their different life stages. Both years, we've managed to hit the, the seasonal phytoplankton bloom. Uh, when all the algae is ramping up its production and the system is just going gangbusters in terms of the amount of energy it's fixing from the sun and the amount of food that's available for the things that eat it, such as the zooplankton. What we're trying to understand is how the seafloor ecosystem is going to change as a result of a temperature shift that we're predicting over the next 80 years or so. Now this is an area where the seafloor and the water column are very interconnected. You have phytoplankton, plants that capture the energy from the sun that are almost directly deposited on the seafloor, and then the seafloor is harvested by marine mammals, including whales and walruses. So one of the things that we're measuring on this cruise is the rate at which sediment breeds, essentially how rapidly it uses oxygen from the overlying water column to support all of the different processes that are going on in it. So by measuring the respiration rates, we'll get a sense of the metabolic rate, essentially, of the organisms and what their demand is, what their needs are for food, and how fast they're using the food that's provided to them. And so with warming predicted to happen in the future, we expect those rates to speed up. And so we really need some better numbers for what's happening now um, so we can make those predictions in the future. My role within Arctic IERP was to bring a group of scientists together to study the fishes and birds that inhabit the Arctic and to also connect that work that we were doing with some of the physical environment and the food web dynamics that the marine ecosystems are experiencing. I'll be able to see how climate variation is impacting the ecosystem and what that means for fish in Alaska. In 2017, we saw some changes in the composition of the fish that we were catching in the southern Chukchi. Instead of young Arctic cod, we were catching more young walleye pollock. So this was something new to us. And in 2019, it was a very different story where pretty much young walleye pollock were dominating the southern Chukchi and all the way up into 70 north. And young Arctic cod were pushed quite a ways north um, in the northern Chukchi. So this is a new dynamic that we think we captured through this Arctic IERP program. One of the questions we were trying to get at is just what sort of energy flow are we seeing in the Arctic? 
One of the interesting things from the IERP was the movement of the subarctic cod species into the Chukchi Sea. So Pacific cod and walleye pollock moved farther north in the Chukchi than had been observed in earlier years. And so what I was doing was looking at the fat storage in the two Arctic species, Arctic cod and saffron cod as well as the two subarctic species, Pacific cod and walleye pollock. And what those analyses showed was a very unique fat storage pattern in Arctic cod, where they, at a given size, had two to three times more fat than the other southern cod species that are moving north. So that was an interesting result in, for the food web and for other predators that are feeding on these fish that you really can't just replace the unique Arctic cod with southern species that are moving north. So if you think about what we saw then in terms of the changes in the warmer years were in 2019, most of the area that we covered in our survey in the Chukchi Sea was made up of Wally Pollock. They don't have as much lipids, so you're getting less of that energy from the lower part of the food web up to seabirds and mammals. So they're not as nutritious. And so this is really changing the ecosystem in terms of the energy flow that we're seeing from the lower trophic level all the way up to humans. One of the, the good things about using acoustic monitoring, so using sounds to monitor animals, is that all marine mammals use sound for communication, for navigation, to find food, to find mates, and fortunately for us, they all make species-specific sounds, which is a walrus sounds very different from a bowhead whale, that sounds different from a beluga whale, that sounds different from a killer whale. So we can use our data, even if we can't see the animals, to tell the animals apart. And the Bering Strait region in the northern Bering Sea and southern Chukchi is an incredibly dynamic area. So in the winter, we hear sea ice, we hear bowhead whales singing, you hear bearded seals and belugas and walrus, and it can actually be almost like a jungle. It's really noisy. At other times of the year, when there's less sea ice, we might hear ships go by. Increasingly, we're hearing other species, so subarctic species, whale species that spend most of their time in the North Pacific or the Southern Bering Sea. These are species like killer whales and humpback whales that people might be familiar with, that we are hearing increasingly both further north in the Arctic and over a much longer time period. What we're hearing are increases in the numbers of ships that are passing through the Arctic. This is a novel noise. It can be pretty loud. And the problems really occur when these sounds, such as are made by big ships, overlap the bandwidth or the frequencies used by marine mammals. Ships have started to go through Bering Strait 12 months of the year, including in winter, including west of St. Lawrence Island, which in the winter is really critical habitat and a hot spot for bowhead whales, for walrus, for belugas, for bearded seals. Marine mammals are critical to food security, they are critical to culture, and they are critical to the spiritual well-being of the people who live in the Arctic. Understanding threats to marine mammals, changes in their migration, uh, other species moving in, I think is really an important part of understanding the integrated ecosystem because what we often forget, especially if we think about the Arctic, is people are part of this ecosystem. People have been part of the ecosystem for millennia. So the Inupiat and the Yupik, who live along the Northwest Coast, who live on Diomede Island, who live on St. Lawrence Island, they've been living there for millennia, they have been adapting there for millennia, and all of the villages, if you look at a map, are placed at points where marine mammals migrate at some time of the year. When we talk about researchers and communities both being very invested in the ecosystem, there's some common ground, but there are also some important differences or complementarity that both sides bring. For the communities, of course, this is home. This is where their ancestors have lived. This is the environment they know. This is where their culture is based on these animals and these places and everything that they can find in the environment. And so this is literally an existential matter. This is them. This is their past, their present, and their future can't get a whole lot more invested in things than that. I think we had a, up to eight coastal communities meeting together to talk among themselves and to see what they were observing and to 
to get them in the role not just of providers of information, but also analysts and interpreters to help make sense of all of that information that's been gathered in so many other ways. And to say, okay, well, what does this tell us about what's going on? To me, the fascinating thing about a program like the Arctic IERP is drawing together people who are studying so many different aspects of the ecosystem, from the, the physical conditions all the way up to the top trophic levels, the top predators, and so on, and including the coastal communities. And by getting everybody together thinking about this, we start to be able to see things that are not apparent if you're just looking at, at one piece. I mean, we're not talking about little change, we're talking about massive shifts. A lot of research has gone on. The Arctic IARP will add important new information, but there's a great deal we know already. How do we make sense of it? How do we think through what this means for coastal communities? And again, not us researchers telling communities what we think it means for them, but involving them in the process of figuring that out so that it makes sense to them and they're understanding it in a way that they can apply to their own futures. It's a massive undertaking to conduct one of these IERPs using an ecosystem approach. And that can be measured not only in cost, for example, the Arctic IERP cost over $18 million. It involved tens of thousands of hours of personnel time for more than 75 scientists who were involved in the work. But it can also be measured in output. More than 50 peer-reviewed science papers published, over 100 presentations given, including many of those in Arctic communities and to co-management organizations that really rely on our understanding of the ocean to support their subsistence way of life. You can find more information about IERPs on our website. Please visit www.nprb.org.